Friends, the journey of God with his people in the scriptures is one that's packed full of, let's call it texture. There's uh, some closeness, then there's rebellion, there's running away from God, there's disobedience, and there's God going after his people once again. It's a beautiful image. And yet, all through this, from the very beginning, there's been an intention that God has had for his people. When God made his covenant with Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the entire world. I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the entire world. The image is that God is forming an entire people to be a holy priesthood. Remember the work of a priest. What would a priest do? A priest goes into the temple and serves as the mediator between God and the people, offering sacrifices for atonement. The priest served as a mediator. Now, in the new covenant, we have a great high priest. Jesus himself. And yet there is this ongoing work where God is forming a temple, right? We saw that last week where Paul says that the Galatians are being pulled together with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And it's in him that the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord, the church as a temple in which mediation can happen. Blessed to be a blessing. Friends, that mandate, that, that intention that was packed into the covenant that God made with Abraham is an intention that's carried forward to us. We see it all through the New Testament. You can think of Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Right? In both of those, the idea is that you are impacting the culture in which you live in in beautiful ways. God is doing something in the world, in a particular people, in order to bless more generally, more universally. Friends, we've been working through Ephesians, and we've seen incredible works. And uh, you, I've noted that Paul is excited about what he's saying. In chapter 1, we saw that breathless, long, ongoing sentence that went on forever. Now here, we're digging into Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to see again that there is a long, run-on sentence. Paul's just so excited. He's so excited with all that he is communicating, because all of this is, uh, you can think of it as like meta stuff, macro stuff. This is zoomed out. This is the big thing that God has done in the world through Jesus. And he wants the church to know about it. So it's what we've been walking through these past few weeks. If you've missed it, I encourage you to go back. They're all on the website. You can catch up. But today we're digging into Ephesians chapter 3. And here Paul says, in verse 1, he says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Now, in my Bible, there's a little dash. Because then he goes on a bit of a tangent. And he talks about his place, what God has done in his life, and prepared him to say what he's going to say. It's meaningful. But then down in verse 14, we see him get back on track with this thought. So he, again, verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And then down in verse 14, For this reason. So he's back on thought. So we're just going to start in verse 14. That's not to say that the previous stuff didn't matter. It does matter. Right? It emphasizes who Paul is and how Christ has worked in his life to prepare him to speak these words. Suffice it to say, Paul has been moved by Christ and Christ has worked in his life and given him a position to speak this. So when we hear this, we know this stuff matters. So let's hear this with the words as Paul intended. He says, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, 
from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now, immediately, when you see that, what's the image you have of Paul? Well, he says he kneels. This is a physical posture, right? This is his whole body showing an act of humility and worship to the Father. Now, it's fascinating to dig into this. When you look at sort of Jewish rhythms of prayer, generally, Jewish people stand for prayer. It was seen that kneeling in prayer was more of a Gentile posture. It was the posture you would see in the temples of Baal. It's almost as if Paul is saying this God is bigger than all gods, and, and he is up to something. And this posture that you know as Gentiles who have discovered Christ, this posture of humility, this posture of outright worship, I'm showing you that this is the posture that I'm bringing to my God. It communicated to the Gentiles something that would have been missed by lots of the Jews, because again, generally Jews stood for prayer. There's only a couple times in the Old Testament where people are shown to be kneeling in prayer. But for this reason, he kneels. Again, humility, worship, passionate worship that he's showing to those who are reading. Now notice that, and again, Father, Father. Maybe, you know, lots has been said, and you've probably heard sermons where Abba was mentioned. Daddy. That's not the word we have here. Abba is a relational term. Again, daddy, it's, it shows a closeness. This father, this word is pater. And it's more of a positional term. Father as head of the household. Father as patriarch. Father as the one who is all over all. Right? You think of those mafia families where the godfather was over all. And you may have people in different places, in different things, but they know that their lineage goes back to the Godfather. They're part of his family. This is the image here we have. For this reason I kneel before the pater, father, from whom every family, patria. Like even in the Greek, there's a word play going on here. So this family is the family under the father, who is God. But what does he say? For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. Now when you see words like this, there's a, uh, again, it's a linguistic device. Think of it like bookends. In heaven and on earth, and it implies everything in between. Heaven and earth and everything in between. Paul is declaring something huge here, right? Every family in every, heaven and on earth, everything, God is the Father. God is the Father. In many respects, friends, all creation is being claimed here. All creation is being claimed here. God is the Father of all creation, in a positional sense. So when we see the birds flying through the air, Paul declares they are creation with God as their father. When we see trees and shrubs, God is their father in a positional sense. When we see people from different cultures, different places, they too trace their lineage back to God their father, because friends, they are in heaven or earth, right? This idea of they are part of creation. They are part of all that's encapsulated by God, the father. And Paul sees this overwhelming image, and that's why he's on his knees, showing the Gentiles that God is big. God is massive. God is over all, the father of all. a reminder again, you remember last week how we dug through the separation between the Jews 
and the Gentiles. And we saw that in Christ, the dividing wall of hostility has been brought down. And Paul's articulating that it's brought down because even though those Gentiles had been separated from the Jews, the reality is that God has always been their father. It was just a bit unknown, and yet now it's revealed in Christ. The dividing wall of hostility has come down. So he has this little introduction in this prayer, and he says, I'm, again, I'm kneeling before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now, that section, this verse 14 and 15, starts this long run-on sentence, and it goes all the way to verse 19. So again, when you think of a sentence, a sentence is usually meant to encapsulate one thought. So the thought here is that Paul is actually wants all of this to be joined together. So he's kneeling in humility and worship to God who is Father of all. And then he's praying that out of his glorious riches, the Father who has positional authority, out of his riches, uh, out of his glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, again, our translators have put those in multiple sentences, but Paul had them all as one sentence. It's one run-on sentence. Joining the Father of all with this unimaginable love. Friends, the reality is that when we see in John 3.16 that God loved the world, He actually loved the world. Right? This is an echo of this bold truth that God's love is a love that is over all and through all and meant for all. Going back here to verse 16. In his prayer, he's praying that out of the Father's glorious riches, that he may strengthen with power through his Spirit in the inner beings of the Galatians. When we think of, again, you know, I see the outside of all of you. And you all look gorgeous. Now, I don't see any of you online, but I know you're sitting there. Maybe beside a loved one, and they can see you, but they can only see your exterior. Right? We only see what's on the outside. But here, Paul's saying, his prayer is that it's actually the inside that's being impacted inside where no one sees that inner being out of which we make decisions we hope we dream we act and he's praying that in that place there would be conformity to Christ in that place Be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, he's stitching together that thought of inner being and hearts, right? So when we we see this sort of language, Paul's talking about the center of who the Galatians were as individuals, the control room of their lives, that place out of which, again, decisions are made out of that place of intellect, out of that place of will, out of that place of, again, where their hopes and dreams are actually formed. And he's saying, in that place that controls your inner thoughts, controls your actions and your behavior, that ends up coming on the outside, in that internal space, may it be conformed to Christ. Now, the beauty here, friends, is that no one sees where this conformity is is that, how, how, how conformed it is to Christ. 
Right? We, we know that Jesus calls out the hypocrites, the play actors, those who have their exterior as trying to speak one message where their interior has not aligned. And yet here, Paul's prayer is that that in, inner space would be aligned with Christ. And the, then out of that inner space, then it moves into that outer space. So friends, I want to encourage you. Before you ever try to, on, just on the outside, follow Jesus, I want, you to, I want to encourage you to pause. I want to encourage you, you think of that posture that Paul's described in, of bending a knee in humility. And I want to encourage you to, even in that inner space, come before the Father on bended knee. And echoing the words of Christ in Gethsemane, we can say, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. May there be less of me and more of Christ in this place that controls me my will, my intellect, my hopes, my dreams, my thoughts, my emotions. Christ, may you fill. Fill us to overflowing. This is Paul's prayer, that they would be so filled by Christ through the power of the Spirit, based on the glorious riches of the Father. Notice how there's a Trinitarian image here. The three persons of, of the Godhead shaping and forming us as people, as we submit like Paul's submitting, as we bend a knee like Paul's bending a knee. Now, now friends, it's interesting, and I may be on my own here. I like Twitter. Even post-Elon Musk taking over, I still like Twitter. And in Twitter, it actually gives me a window into lots of different perspectives of Christians all over, mostly North America. I haven't uh, exploded my feed yet to the global church, and I, I, I need to do that. But for the most part, again, in, in North America, my, my, my feed is open to, and I have to say that there is a toxic masculinity that has infiltrated the church, and at the same time, there is a uh, almost a, a feminist ideology that moves on unhealthy rhythms that has also invaded the church. Where we have put ourselves and our standing ahead of Christ, whether that be as men, whether that be as women, whether that be as people who are wrestling with who they may be in their inner being, when we put ourselves ahead of Christ, toxicity emerges. Toxicity emerges. It happens all over the place, and oftentimes it gets stamped with the stamp of Jesus. Paul bends a knee, and he goes to prayer and humility and worship, and friends, when we take on that posture in our inner self, and we say, less of me and more of Christ, then it's less about, again, this toxicity that emerges in us, and what comes is actually rhythms of Jesus. Rhythms of Jesus. Things like sacrifice. Things like being peacemakers, sowing the seeds of peace and harmony, of shalom, of standing for justice and righteousness, standing with those who have been pushed to the margins of society. And again, we can do that freely because again, we know that that barrier, the dividing wall of hostility has been torn down in Jesus. So we're in good standing when we sow seeds for peace, justice, righteousness. That's like Jesus. It's not about us. It's actually about Christ and what he's up to. There's a beauty there. And friends, I got to tell you where it says, I pray that his glorious, out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power 
This isn't strength and power for more toxicity. This is strength and power to move against cultural rhythms. To again, stand with the outcasts. To sow seeds of peace. To stand for justice and righteousness in the face of a world that may think that's not what the church is about. And in this again, we rest. And in verse 17, the hope is that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And again, our heart is that place, that seed of our total identity, all of ourselves. And then he continues in verse 17 there, and he says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, think of the image of your garden. I know uh, the Atkinson family, I saw a picture of, of your bulb that you got during Advent, that little hope bulb. I don't know about any of you, but they planted that hope bulb, and that little hope bulb was sprouting. Right? Right? That, that image of it's taking roots. Now, where are the roots? Being rooted and established in love. Right? Rooted and established in love. And then on to verse 18. May have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Now, notice how he doesn't say I pray that you alone in the corner of your room. He says, no. Rooted and established in love that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. This dynamic of a life rooted in love is one that's rooted in community. One that's rooted in fellowship. Now, Again, holy has lots of connotations. Yes, it's about walking in the rhythms of God, but it's also about being set apart. So this idea is that we experience the love of God as people set themselves apart through their actions by allowing Christ to rule in their lives. Love is the result. Love is the result. So how can you tell a church that is rooted in love and allowing Christ to rule in their lives? Love's the result. Love's the result. And we see it in community as our lives rub up against each other. As we come alongside and collect cards and notes and pictures and items to give to a little boy who's in hospital hurting, who we've never met. And we say, yeah, but God loves you. So can we show you just a little bit of love? As we come alongside day by day, week by week, we experience God's love in the context of church family. Friends, this is why church culture gets so toxic when it goes wrong. Right? When there's infighting, when agendas take root, when people actually start rejecting and pushing people away. Because the purpose of church submitted to Christ is for people to experience love. And it will always be love that they experience. Now, this love is a love that says, hey, I love you and I want what's best for you. Right? It's that love that comes alongside like that parental love. Right? Like love doesn't just let, say, my parental love for my kids doesn't just let them stay on screens all day as much as they'd love to. They don't know what's best for themselves all the time. They're still kids. And in the same way, we as humans are still trying to figure out what's best for us. And so love is a love that comes alongside and challenges and encourages and yes, provides a soft place to land. Grace woven all the way through. But it's love. It's real love felt and experienced doesn't push away. And I love Paul's description right, of God's love. Can, can, try to picture this in your mind. Together with all the Lord's holy people, so in the context of community, to grasp how wide, how long, 
how high, so now we're at three-dimensional, right? A three-dimensional image, and how deep is the love of God? What does deep mean in that context? We've already got three dimensions. How long, how wide, how high, and how deep. Paul's introducing a 4D image. I, I can't think of a 4D image. There you go. <laughs> He's introducing something that's uh, infinite, something unimaginable, something unmeasurable. A love that literally surpasses knowledge, right? And he says that. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Right? He's just describing a love that blows him away, and he's trying to encapsulate it in words. And he's saying, God, who is Father of all, out of his power, through the Spirit, may Christ have a place of ruling and reigning in your life. And in that place, may you come to know as you're rooted with all the Lord's holy people in love, know this vast, unimaginable love. This blows me away. Because all too often, the love that we've experienced and even the love that we share is often contingent Right? We offer a contingent love. We've experienced a contingent love. If you do X, Y, and Z, when you do X, Y, and Z, then you'll know the love. Paul's actually describing a love without contingencies. A love that isn't based on if statements or when statements. It's a love that is filtered in and through the entire cosmos. A love unimaginable. And yet, the, the, friends, this is the love that we as a church are invited to reflect to a world that has caught glimpses of God's love because, again, the whole world's filled with his love. They've caught glimpses of it, but they may not have a name for it. God intended the, his people from the beginning, when he first made a covenant with Abraham, to, that they were blessed to be a blessing. And we see that coming forward, the church is also blessed to be a blessing, to be salt, to be light, to share this message of hope and love to a world that desperately needs it. A love that's not contingent. When you repent, when you change, if you you know, do this, if you believe how I believe, if you say this prayer, when you go over here, then you get to experience it. He actually says, this love is full to overflowing. And because of that love, again, there's an invitation to walk in step with God day by day by day because God as Father does know what's best for us. He does know what's best for us. Now, when he says that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Again, that's a big statement. Being filled with all, all the fullness of God. And this comes right on the heels of, again, experiencing this unimaginable love. So all the fullness of God is a love to overflowing. But this idea of, of that you may be filled is that the filling is an ongoing process that as you continue to submit and as you continue to walk and as you continue to be shaped and as you continue to be formed, as you continue to, to, to journey towards Jesus, that you will be filled with more and more love, reflecting God's love to the world. Now, it's, he, it's a process of filling, but it's also this idea of fullness as a promise and a hope still to be realized and in in, in completed one day. So it's a process ongoing today to be completed one day. So we get to experience this in part, but there may be, uh, again, we're relying on Christ, His Spirit, His love, and 
day by day, there's times where we again, get back up off of our knee, where we stop submitting to Christ because we haven't been fully shaped, fully formed, fully filled with the love of God. And we may end up causing damage again. We may end up being a little bit more selfish. We may end up fighting. We may end up causing harm. We may end up in rebellion once again. There's a process going on. We're being shaped. We're being formed. And day by day, are we bending a knee to Christ or are we walking tall on our own two feet, carrying our own agenda? The image here, though, is again that God is up to something. Would we be submissive to what he's doing, filling us with that love, shaping and forming us in that inner place so that our outward actions may fall in line? And then he closes. So that was one sentence. All that I talked about today was his first sentence in this section. It's all one big thought, tied and woven together. And now he gives a bit of a benediction in this portion of his epistle. And he says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Friends, based on God as Father, through the work of his Spirit in our lives, as Jesus is in that inner place shaping and forming our hearts. As we root our lives and our lives together in that soil of love and we catch glimpses of this unimaginable, unexplainable love. And God continues to shape and form us, fill us. Well, friends, that's where then Paul gets. And in this place... We ask that God would do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. And it happens, friends, when we submit to Jesus in our lives. This is my prayer for our church. This is my prayer for our church. That God would do more than we could ask or imagine. Now, it's not just a little bit more. Immeasurably more than what we could ask or imagine. Now, f- please, don't get me wrong here. I, I, I love every single person who's here and every single person that's joining us on the live stream. And if people find us and say, okay, I, I want to weave my life into the life of that, that congregation and be shaped and formed by you know, what's going on there and be pointed to Jesus there, Great. Right? I want us to grow as a congregation. But when I read this, I don't imagine tearing down this building and bigger, building a bigger building. I imagine greater submission, greater sacrifice, greater healing, greater love, greater compassion right? flowing through this. That this is a place where people can come and experience God's love and grace in such a way that it is like a safe harbor from a world that doesn't care. Immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Shaping and forming us in our inner spots first and then moving outwards to impact people in all manner of ways. It's my prayer. According to the power at work in us, this is Jesus, to him be the glory in the church. It's my prayer that that as God does immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, that it would bring himself glory through what's happening in our church as we align with Christ and his leading and guiding. Friends, as we move from this series, I long that all of the things we've talked about these last six weeks would kind of burrow down in you, that the seeds that have been sown in our, the soil of our lives would take root and that there would be bear fruit. And that fruit 
aligned with Christ and what he's up to in the world. Let me just pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you uh, are Father of all. All the families in heaven and on earth. And that you're at work in your spirit. I pray that we would get out of the way, allow Christ to be on the thrones of our lives, shaping and forming us in that inner place so that we would not only know your love, but that we would be able to show your love. Allow people to experience your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.